wondered about that. I thought about uh, that several times. We always do this uh, uh, several months in advance, and sometimes one does not remember these critical dates. But like the stalwart she is, she never complained. And in fact, it's, um, it's a tribute to the, the excellence of her scholarship that so many people are here uh, today. Anyway. <laughs> um, uh, Professor um, Sen's talk, as you know, is uh, Professor of Sociology at Wayne State University here. She, she received her BA from the University of Detroit in 1958. Uh, and an AM from the University of Michigan and Arbor in 1960, and a PhD in sociology from Washington University, St. Louis, in 1967. She's been here uh, teaching at Wayne State since 1966. So uh, we were able to recognize uh, the quality of her scholarship. And since then, she has been the sort of part of the scaffolding that has supported this excellent department of sociology that has attracted um, many uh, brilliant scholars to, to it. And she has produced a number of excellent students. I had the privilege of serving on the uh, discussion committees of some of them, and uh, they've gone on to great things. Her special area of interest are ethnic uh, groups in the United States, family violence, gerontology, and the sociology of law. She's conducted research primarily in the area of abuse and neglect of the elderly and ethnic diversity. For over 40 years, she has been conducting research on the Chaldeans, a community of Christian immigrants from Iraq residing in the Detroit metropolitan area. And she's written three books about this community. Her newest book, entitled Voices of Diversity in Multiculturalism in America, is a study of uh, people from multicultural or multiracial families. It was published in 2009. Dr. Stenstock has been a consultant for over 40 years on spouse abuse, elderly abuse, and ethnic communities to numerous agencies including the Michigan State Department for Human Services, the Chaldean Federation, Open Hospital, Dearborn, and others. But she's also been a friend of the, of the Humanities Center. She has given papers almost every year uh, in our Brown Back series beginning in 2005. Um, in 2005, for example, she uh, presented on multiculturalism, who comes and who doesn't. And in 2010, she presented on voices of diversity, interviews with people on the simulation side of multiculturalism. So I'm glad to welcome to the podium a friend of the Humanity Center, an excellent scholar, and I have not mentioned the service this, this great woman has given to this university community. Uh, on the Senate and other places of influence. So I'm delighted to welcome to the podium Professor Senstock, who will talk to us and remind us that not all Iraqi immigrants are Chaldeans. Please welcome her to the podium. Thank you and thank you everyone. It's nice to be here. And um, I'm going to begin by explaining this rather odd the title that I gave my talk for today. Um, as somebody who has been studying ethnic groups for a very long time, one of the things that has always annoyed me is the fact that Americans tend to want to generalize about everything. We want to get everything into a nice, neat little box, and then we can put it, and it shouldn't be a very big box. It should be a little box, because we can't extend our brains, I guess, for very far. And whenever I would mention that Chaldeans were Iraqis, they'd say, Arabs, Muslim. No, Chaldeans are not Muslim, and they don't consider themselves Arabs. I remember one time, I, one of the first lectures I gave uh, was to a group 
that I was talking about Chaldeans, and I was saying where they that where they live, and she said, and Dearborn, Chaldeans live in Dearborn, and I said, now Chaldeans don't generally live in Dearborn, and this woman, I could see on the face on her face, why am I listening to this idiot woman who is trying to talk about Chaldeans, and she doesn't know that they are all over Dearborn. Chaldeans don't live in Dearborn. Well, um, I've also had people say, oh, if you're fill in the blank about some nationality, then you must be, um, I had a friend who happens to be Jewish, and he was asked by somebody um, where he's from, and he said, well, my family is from Poland. He said, oh, I didn't know you were Roman Catholic. <laughs> he says, I'm not. And he said, well, you have to be. Polish people are always, this is what I mean by the little box. Well, let's take our Iraqi immigrant box and open it up and realize that it's a little bigger than most of us thought it was. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Is it going to work? There we go. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Here we go. Um, I'm going to start by telling you what Iraq is like and where the groups we're going to talk about are from. Um, Iraq is the, the area that is outlined in yellow. It's bordered on the east by Iran, on the north by Syria and Turkey, on the west by Jordan, and on the kind of south, southwest by Saudi Arabia. And of course, everybody knows it is also bordered in, by Kuwait, because that was the first war that we had was about borders with uh, Iraq and Kuwait. Um, there are the three groups I'm going to be talking about are the Christians, including the Chaldeans, and I've also included the Kurds with them, although Kurds can be just like the other Iraqis. Some can be Christian, some can be Muslim, and different kinds of Muslim. And most of the Christians and Kurds live or originate from the north, which is um, around, I've got, you see the sign, the very large name Tokef up there. That's the town that most of the Chaldeans in the Tri-County area come from. And it's near Mosul. And this is this is that part of the area that the Kurds claim to be their land. Um, Kurds would like to have their own country. They want to be Kurdistan. And they would claim parts of all this area in the north, uh, Turkey and Iran and Syria and Iraq. Um, they had hoped that in the division of Iraq after the wars that they would get to be one of the areas that could be its own area. Um, Sunni Muslims tend to live in the central area around Baghdad, right across the middle. Um, Shia Muslims, and we'll get into a discussion at some point later about the differences, tend to be from the south. And you will see a big K in the middle. Um, that is a um, city that I will talk about later as part of this division between the Sunni and the Shia. Um, okay, so just kind of keep this geography in mind <laughs> as we go through. Um, let me go back and give you a brief, very brief history of Iraq. And I'm going back, when I say pre-20th century, I am starting very pre because I'm starting before the um, Common Era. It was Mesopotamia. And Mesopotamia, if you remember from grade school, as most of us had to learn about the Fertile Crescent and the, the um, cradle of civilization. And that's, that's what this was. Um, and it's the area around the Tigris and Euphrates Valleys. Uh, it is the origin, according to the Bible, of Abraham, uh, who is listed as being from Ur of the Chaldees. I remember as a kid, I thought the Chaldees were mountains. You know, the Pyrenees are mountains, and Andes are mountains. Well, I thought if he was Ur of the Chaldees, that must be mountains. It's not. It's the people that live there, the Chaldeans that like to take their name from them. Um, and Abraham is considered the father of the three religions that we're going to talk about today. Jewish, of course, Christian, and Islam. Um, 
The major groups that were around at that time are Akkadians, Sumerians, Assyrians, Babylonians, and Jews. They were all in this area. Um, in the first century of the Common Era, uh, the, many of the people in this area were converted to Christianity. The Chaldeans here claim very prod, proudly that they were converted to Christianity by St. Thomas the Apostle and his apostle, St. Adai. And so they will, the first thing they will say to you is, we were Christian from the beginning. Um, in the seventh century is when um, Islam came into uh, play in the Middle East, and most of the people in Iraq and several other areas were converted to Islam. In the 16th and 17th centuries, the Ottoman Empire held sway in most of this area, and then in the 19th century was the, the period of British colonialism in the area, and Iraq uh, basically um, came under the sway of the British Empire. And this included a great deal of additional Christian proselytizing in the area, this time from Protestant missionaries from the British Isles. So this takes us up to 1900. Um, in 1914, there were a number of hostilities involving um, forces from the local area, from the British government, and from the Ottoman forces. In uh, 1918, uh, there was a British protectorate over the area, which is beginning to be known as Iraq. And in 1932, Iraq became an independent nation um, as determined by the League of Nations. Uh, 39 to 45, of course, is World War II, and um, that will come to play in terms of immigration in a few minutes. I'll talk about that. In 1948 was the establishment of Israel, and this created a lot of problems. This was a beginning of the major problems between the Arab world and the Jews in the area. In 68, Saddam Hussein assumed control of Iraq, and in 73, we'll go back to the Kurds, there was a Kurdish uprising in northern Iraq. And then we entered the picture in 1990, was the first Iraq and U.S. war, which involved Kuwait, and in 2003, the U.S. forces invading um, Iraq in the fall of Hussein. I, very brief picture of the history, and a lot of these little themes play a role in a lot of different ways. Um, the major groups in Iraq, this is, again, we Americans tend to be awfully narrow-minded. We like to say we're the most diverse country that's ever existed in the history of the world. We're wrong. We're not. There are other diverse countries, too. And there are several major groups in Iraq, very different groups in Iraq. At the time of the British Protectorate, which as I said is 1918, uh, they counted about two million Iraqis. About a little over half were Shiite Muslims. Um, Kurds constituted about 20%, and as I said before, they were in that northern part, and they speak Kurdish. They do not speak Arabic. Um, and they are divided among Iraq, Turkey, Iran, and other areas. And uh, so that's another group. Sunni Mus Muslims are a minority of the Iraqi population, but, and here's another issue that plays a role in the interaction between these groups. They have been historically the majority of the government in the army, and they were the, the party, the connection to the Ba'ath Party, which of course was Saddam Hussein's party. Um, other minorities, Christians, Jews, and everybody else, are less than 10% of the population at the time of the um, British Protectorate. The Jewish community at that time, and this is again an important number to remember, constituted about 120,000 members according to what the British government counted. 
So it's quite a I mean, it, we're talking about small minority groups in, but that's not an insignificant number of people, 120,000 people. Um, and that's what the Jewish community was at the time. Incidentally, many of them, um, they claim to be the modern day descendants of the Jews from the Babylonian captivity. Um, if you read any of the historians who talk about the Middle East and these people, uh, historians will say, who knows that? And it's very difficult to trace back these things and find out if it really is accurate to say that these are the descendants of that. How can I, how can anyone claim that this group of people really is descended way back? Um, 3,000, 4,000 years, hard to say, but this is what their claim is. And I believe we should take their word for it. If they believe they are, I, I'm willing to do that. Um, in the United States, and frankly, we're going to talk mostly about the Iraqis here. Um, the first known Iraqi to come to the United States came in 1889, and he went to Philadelphia, not to Detroit. Um, he stayed there for a while, I don't know exactly how long, and he worked in a hotel. And he decided to become an entrepreneur, which lots of Iraqis are, and lots of Chaldeans are. And he went back to Iraq and opened his own hotel in Baghdad. The major immigration to the United States from Iraq started in the early 20th century, around 1910 might be able to go back to 1905. Um, and in the first decade or so, there's maybe eight, 10, a dozen people, almost all of them men here. Um, in 1920, we introduced in the United States the quota system. I don't know how much you know about the quota system, but the immigration into the United States until 1920 was pretty much open. The United States was here. If people wanted to come, they just paid whatever pennies they could squeeze together to get on a boat and come over here, and they came, and that's the way they did it. After 19, well, in the first couple of decades of the 20th century, people, the guy on the street, and Congress, and a lot of people got really upset about all these hordes who were coming in from other places and changing the picture of America. And this became something that was very disturbing. And so we had a number of bills in Congress which eventually resulted in what we now call the quota system, which placed limitations on um, immigration and the limits were based upon how many people from that nation were already here. In other words, the goal of Congress was to let people come in who wouldn't change the picture much. So if there were lots of, of English people here, then they, you could let lots of more English people come in. If there were lots of Germans, and there were, well, that was okay too, sort of. Um, they wanted to limit people who didn't fit very well. And um, so the quota system was set up that way. In fact, the law went back to the 1890 census to decide what that number of people should be because already in 1920 there were too much of this riffraff from the wrong places. And so they didn't want to count these people like Greeks, people like Italians, people like Eastern Europeans. Basically, you wanted to limit those groups. And so they went back to 1890. So that's where we get the quota system. In 1965, we changed the laws again. And we eliminated the quota system. Um, as I often wonder if they knew what was going to happen when they changed the quota system, if they would have changed the quota system. But anyway, they did change the quota system. And 
this resulted from our perspective as allowing Iraqis to come into the United States, uh, allowed a lot more Iraqis to come in. Because what it really did was to take the quota that had belonged to all these countries and dump them into two big quotas, an Eastern, uh, Eastern Hemisphere and a Western Hemisphere. And so people from, um, since many of the European countries hadn't used their quotas in decades, those numbers could then be passed around to everybody else. And what happened is that, um, I'm not going to go into all the numbers, but if you look at who's come since 1965, we've had more Asians, we've had more Africans, we've had more um, people from the Middle East. The variation is much bigger, which is exactly why they didn't allow these people in originally. Um, okay, what has happened in Iraq? It's, one of the things you need to look at whenever you talk about immigration is what we in sociology call the push-pull theory. First of all, everybody who is perfectly contented where they are stays where they are. It's only if you're a little itchy and uncomfortable that you go someplace else, even inside. So if you can find a really neat job in Michigan that's right around the corner from where you live, why go anywhere else? It's got to be a lot better job for you to go there. But if you can't find a job, or not when you want, then you start looking around. And the same is true of international migration. And so, um, as long as things back home are fine, people don't move. Things in Iraq have gotten really bad in the last couple of decades. Um, and certainly after, even in 1965, um, Iraq has had a lot of problems for a long time. And so people want to leave. And when they want to leave, that's the push. They're getting shoved out, either by bad economy or all kinds of things like that. So they're leaving. And where do they go? They go to some place that offers something. And so what's happened there in the last, since 1990, is that two wars and a lot of problems have made it very difficult to live in Iraq. And um, as a result, the 1990 census listed almost 45,000 Iraqis, Iraqi immigrants and their children in the United States. By 2000, it had doubled to almost almost 90,000, and in 2009, estimates were that there are about 245 to 265,000 in the Iraqis in the United States. So this is what I mean when I say what's happening is that more people are coming to the United States, and specifically for our perspective, Iraqis. So we've got a lot larger Iraqi community than we did three or four decades ago. Um, we have also a number of Iraqi institutions in the Tri-County area. Um, most of them are Christian. And this is the part where, yes, a lot of, of the Iraqi immigrants here and their children are Christian, are specifically Chaldean, um, and it's changing. But um, we have, I've listed eight churches uh, it's really not. Um, Chaldeans have seven churches, and they're building what they call a mission uh, for the eighth one, which will probably turn into a church, but they haven't gotten around to building it yet. And most of them, if you look at that gray area that's in the middle, it's kind of growing over into Macomb County, but most of it is in the, the southeastern part of Oakland County. That's where most of the Chaldeans, the um, Iraqi Christians uh, in the Tri-County area live. There's another community. If you see those two little pieces in the middle of Detroit are um, Highland Park and Hamtramck. And there is a Chaldean community right near there where there's another church. And if you see that big cave down there just below the name of Detroit, 
that's the Kalb Karbalashia Center, which it, it's in Dearborn, but it is specifically for one particular group of, um, of Muslims. And we'll talk about all of those. Well, I, I won't talk about all the churches, but we will talk about the differences. Um, all right, so we have three major groups of immigrants. The Christians are the most numerous because they've been coming a lot longer. They began coming in the early 20th century. The Muslims are the second largest number. A few came in the early 20th century, but most have been refugees since the Iraqi wars. Um, and Jews are the smallest number, and there aren't very many in the Detroit area. Uh, and most of them came following the foundation of Israel. Incidentally, um, I'm going to talk mostly about the Detroit Iraqi communities. However, um, there are some Iraqi immigrants that are other parts of the, of the United States uh, for a variety of reasons, but uh, there's another part of the push-pull theory. When you go somewhere, it's a lot easier to get along there if you know some people that can give you a few hints as to how it is to, to deal with this new place you're living in. And so if you're Iraqi, you're very likely to come to the Detroit area instead of somewhere else. And so that's another big part of it. Um, what are the ways that they differ? All right, first of all, for centuries, Iraq was a tribal society. The identity of people was primarily with their village or their tribe. It was not with a nation. And remember, Iraq hasn't been a nation for very long. And so the, whenever you have a new nation, you have a new identity, you have to start developing it. You get, have to get people to begin to think that way. Um, the, these are people who speak different languages. I've already talked about the fact that they're, the uh, the Arabs are there, and these are the primarily the, the Muslims, so they speak Arabic. The Chaldeans speak Aramaic. The Kurds speak Kurdish. And so when you have a lot of languages dividing you, that makes another division. I, my mother's family comes from Belgium. Half of Belgium speaks, speaks Flemish, the other half speaks French. I've always told people the reason I am split in the middle the way I am because one half of my family comes from Ireland and they're split by religion and the other half comes from Belgium and they're split by language. I understand what it's like to be split in half. And that's what you have here is a nation that's split in more than half. Uh, they have different religious backgrounds. They're different kinds of Christian, different kinds of Muslim and Jews. Uh, they have different historical experiences based largely on these different groups that they come from, and they have a different, different focus for their sense of identity, either their religion or their denomination. Incidentally, one of the things that I must say as a sociologist watching all this happen, it bothers me a lot, um, the Iraqi immigrants here would like to get together and try to help the people back home. And they do try to help the people back home, but they have an enormous problem getting past those divisions, past the Muslim Christian one, past the, the Jewish Christian Muslim one, even past the, I mean, there have been some attempts to get the Christians together to cooperate with each other, sort of. And so they have their big meeting, and they came out and say we're going to meet together, and then I don't hear about anything about it for another three or four years. So there's a lot of um, division in terms of what their sense of identity is. And they maintain, incidentally, we're back to the examples I gave you at the beginning. When people leave, they tend to maintain their old country identity when they come here. And so if you have um, Muslim Iraqis, they tend to band, band together with other Muslim Iraqis, not with all other Iraqis. Now, it depends a little bit on how big the community is. Now, the Chaldean community is so big in Detroit that 140,000 that I was talking about is basically almost all Chaldean. And so 
if you're part of that group, why should you join another one? You've got more than enough people to identify with. But if you're just a little bit of it, like maybe a couple hundred of the Iraqis, and you happen to be Muslim, well, you really aren't that comfortable with them. And so these divisions tend to perpetuate themselves. Incidentally, some groups will deliberately go to another part of the country not to come here. Um, okay, so there still then are considerable differences in terms of religion, in terms of occupation, in terms of language, and where they come when they get here. Um, just to give you a, an example, um, when I talk about Aramaic and, and um, uh, Arabic as being separate languages, people, you know, again, we say, oh well, you know, they're all Middle Eastern. They are different languages, and you can just, the, even the script that's used in writing them is different. And I, I debated putting something up in, in Hebrew up here to show you they're all, I mean, because, well, Again, we're very narrow-minded. Oh, well, they write the, uh, they all write the same direction, but it's not the same language. Uh, so these are very different um, languages, and they have difficulty in, um, identifying with and understanding each other. Okay, so Iraqi Christians are the most numerous, and largely, again, we're back to the push-pull theory. I believe they were the first to come, and the, the most numerous coming for most of this period of the 20th century because of the fact that uh, they were a teeny tiny minority in Iraq, less than 10 percent. And I don't, I've never heard Chaldeans talk like Armenians often do about their discrimination against them. Um, and I've known them a long time, but they will say things like, well, it wasn't pleasant there, or it wasn't easy there. So even if you're not directly feeling pressure, it's uncomfortable. And so I think that's why they were the first to come. Uh, in addition, because they were Christian, many of them were used by the colonial powers, particularly Britain, as assistants. They would be the ones who would know the local area, would understand a lot of what the, what the British were talking about, knew the language, and so they often worked for the colonial powers, which did two th things. First of all, what's the first thing it's going to do? It's going to make them persona non grata over there, right? And so they were even less comfortable and more anxious to get out. And secondly, it gave them an entree to go somewhere else. They knew about the outside world much more than their uh, countrymen did. And so this is an additional reason why they might want to, um, want to leave, want to leave. There, were, there are several denominations. The Chaldeans are Roman Catholic and they're the most numerous. Here, I'm not sure about there. It's, it's more even there. Here, it's really a big difference. However, there are a lot of other ancient Christian sects, like the Nestorians, um, the Orthodox, and a few that are Protestant, converted by the Protestant missionaries in the British uh, colonial period. So you have quite a few different kinds of Christians. And that's the Christian group. Incidentally, the other kinds of Christians, besides the Chaldeans, are scattered throughout the United States. There are quite a few of them in New York. Um, there are some in Chicago, uh, some in California. There's an interesting community in California, which I have visited, um, uh, called Turlock, which, is, which has three different groups of um, of Christians, Protestant ones, uh, Nestorians, and Chaldeans. And it's a rather small community. And because they don't have enough of any one of the religions, they tend to them think of themselves as Assyrian Christians or Iraqi Christians. And they do tend to hang together there 
and here to be married within the group you have to marry say within the Chaldean community or the Protestant community etc there if you marry another Assyrian it doesn't really matter which religion they are very interesting um, okay Chaldeans as I said are the largest group um, came about 1910 most came here and I think probably 150,000 now um, I said I have numbers for 140 but given the great in increase in the last decade I said, probably um, 150 now uh, they got their start in the grocery business and there's still an awful lot of grocers in this area who are Chaldean at one point there were about a thousand or fifteen hundred grocery stores in the tri-county area owned by Chaldeans but they've um, moved out into a lot of other uh, occupations many of them related to the grocery business like they learned how to um, deal in real estate because they want to know where to put their grocery stores and so they moved into that or they build wholesale grocery businesses or that sort of thing um, um, other communities are in San Diego and Arizona quite a few in San Diego incidentally um, in the last 30 years or so there have been two Chaldean Catholic dioceses established in the United States. The first was in this area about 30, 35 years ago, and in the last decade or so there's been another one formed in San Diego for the western half of the country. Um, other Iraqi Christians, like the Chaldeans, they tend not to be Arabic speaking. That doesn't mean they don't speak Arabic now, but their historic language is more likely to be Aramaic, or Syriac, or Assyrian. Not, not Syrian, but Assyrian. Um, many of them will belong to an Aramaic speaking church. And finally, in the 2000 census, um, these groups were able to get the Census Bureau to let them pick Aramaic as an identity. In, you know, the, the question, it's not on the regular census, but the survey that they do of a, of a sample, you can pick Aramaic. Before that, they had to pick Iraqi, and the Chaldeans weren't likely to check off Iraqi, but they might check off um, Aramaic. Um, be, well, if they had to claim being Arabic or Iraqi, they wouldn't be likely to do it. Most of these other Iraqi Christians are in places like New York, California, Illinois, Arizona, and also here. Um, Muslim Iraqis in the United States. Okay, here's where I'm most uncomfortable because I don't know that much about the Muslim religion, and I'm honest about this, but uh, there are two major sects, and some others, in Islam. The Sunni and the Shia. Please note, and I probably should have either underlined or put it in italics, these, this is not a really rigid division. We see it as a, uh, as, a, as a rigid division now because there's so much turmoil and animosity going on. But in many places throughout the Middle East and here, Muslims don't make that strict a decision, as a division between Iraq, uh, the Shia and Sunni. Um, but with the divisions, and people taking, counting up sides, it's become more rigid and more troublesome. Um, Sunni are the numerical majority in the Muslim world. There are more Sunni Muslims than there are Shia. Um, but, and here's another part of the problem, Sunni constitute a numerical minority in Iraq. And whenever you've got a majority that's being ruled by a minority, you got problems. And the ruling party under Saddam Hussein was a Sunni party. And so you've got a group of people who are now a numerical minority who are 
ruling a numerical majority. Shia may be a um, majority in Iraq, but they are a minority in the Muslim world itself. I could have also added here that Shia are a, a majority somewhere else, and that's Iran. And Iran and Iraq have not had good relations for a long time. So within Iraq, many people view the, um, the Shia as the enemy within, if you want to put it that way, the representative of those bad guys out there. Creates problems. Um, I don't know of anybody that's actually counted, but it's my impression that the largest group of Iraqi Muslims in the U.S. are Shiites. Uh, most have tribal um, uneducated backgrounds, and most lived in southern Iraq, at least from the Iraqis. Um, Iraq, remember I told you the great big K? That's the location of Karbala, which is a famous city in, in the history of Islam. And it's a shrine to Shia history, not Sunni history, Shia history. It's the location, after um, Muhammad died, there was a big debate as to who should run the religion. As a Roman Catholic, I know exactly what they're talking about because I've read the history of my own religion and people can fight a lot more about religion than almost anything else there is to fight about. And um, anyway, uh, there was a fight about who was going to run the religion and the, the caliphs were the group that were supposed to, in this Shia idea, I mean the Sunni idea, were who they thought should run the religion. The Shia wanted to have the descendants, the, the blood descendants of the prophet to run the religion. And that person was um, Muhammad's grand, um, not grandson. Godson. Godson, yeah. Uh, that's, that's the wrong word. But he was the, um, he was married he, to um, Mohammed's daughter, Fatima. His cousin, Ali. What? His cousin, Ali. Yeah, but through um, the daughter. Oh, yes. His cousin who was married to Muhammad's daughter, yeah, Fatima. Right. So Ali, his name, and his cousin. Yeah. Okay. It, it's it's a it's a relative of Muhammad, yes. and he was married to Muhammad's daughter, and this was supposed that who the Shia thought should continue the leadership of the community, and that didn't work out that way. And what happened was in this place in Karbala, there was a battle in which he was killed. Anyway, as a result, this puts the. Shia and the Sunni in this battle, but it's over time, it sounds to me a lot like what happened with Protestantism in the United States. Yes, if I'm Lutheran, I really think Lutheran is a lot better than Presbyterian, but most of the time, who cares? And a lot of the time, this is what happened in, in um, the Muslim world between the Sunni and the Shia. There, there has been a lot of intermarriage between Shia and Sunni. Whether people think it should be or not, a lot, there was a lot going on. Um, I talked to a lot of people who were Iraqi immigrants, and they would talk about the friends. They had friends. Chaldeans had Muslim friends. Shia and Sunni were friends with each other, and maybe intermarried. They had Jewish friends in, in Baghdad especially in the educated groups where they would go to the same schools. I know of a, a group in which um, they are all outside. They're all immigrants now. Some are in the United States, some are in Britain, some are in Holland, some are in Australia. And about every two years, there's about a dozen of them, they have a reunion somewhere. Somebody writes everybody, probably, or calls them up on the cell phone, what everybody has, and says, let's t get together my tree. And this group will get together. And it's, it's mixed religion, and it, it, but they're all Iraqi. They're all from this one, basically, school in Baghdad. 
but the divisions have gotten stronger because of all this. Anyway, many of these people have left because of the two U.S. wars, and uh, there's a lot of problems in Iraq right now. The Sunni Muslims, most of them, uh, the earliest ones came before 1980. Uh, largely, they tend to be educated with urban backgrounds. Most of them are professionals. They are more easily assimilated into American <coughs> culture because of their education. Um, uh, many others left after the fall of Hussein and the Ba'ath Party because, again, we're beginning to get this division now, this stronger division there. And when they get there, they tend to join the broader Muslim community. Here, I mean. Um, the people who are not identifying with Iraq um, or with Arabs are mainly Christians, both Chaldeans and other Christians, and Jews and Kurds. And all of them have been at different times the objects of, of discrimination in Iraq. And they didn't identify with Iraq much while they were there. So when they get here, they tend not to associate with other Iraqi immigrant groups, just like lots of other American immigrants groups don't. So these are groups that tend to be isolated um, in little groups of their own when they get here. Um, Iraqi Jews are probably around 15,000 in the United States. Most are in New York, Florida, or California. Iraqi Jews live mainly in Baghdad, and they claimed, as I said before, descent from the old Babylonian captivity, which goes way before the Christian era. And they have a, they're united by website in the United States, um, because they are divided into little tiny groups in these two or three different states. Kurds are primarily from northern Iraq, and they view that as their homeland, Kurdistan, and they want to be a homeland like that. Uh, they're also multi-religious, Sunni, Shia, and Christians, and a few Jews, and they're divided among Iraq, Iran, Turkey, etc. And their goal there is their own nation, and they wanted to have a separate state in the new Iraq, and as uh, when. The President Bush helped to found whatever was going to occur after America left. He uh, saw them as one of three groups there, the Sunni, the Shia, and the Kurds. Um, one of the things that really disturbed the Christians in the United States and there was there was no place for them. That was. Sunni Shia and Kurds were told me, um, uh, Christians didn't. Um, all right, what's it like there? We're out today and why nobody wants to live there. Um, the, the Gulf War and the current war have devastated the country. Um, again, we're back to the Sunni as being still the majority group. Um, Shia as the um, um, largest division, the largest denomination in Iraq, but the minority division outside of it. And um, lots of these people, all groups, are, are refugees at this point. Uh, the Christians include the Chaldeans, these people who call themselves Assyrians and the Protestants. And when they get here, they tend to move into Christian communities. The Chaldeans into their own, because there are enough of them. The others, some of them move into Iraqi Christian communities if they get to a place like New York or some parts of California. Um, otherwise, they just become Christians. Um, the Shia, they tend to be identified with Iraq's enemy, Iran. Many of them have moved into Dearborn. Uh, many of them are in, in refugee camps throughout the Middle East. Um, the Sunni who are educated, many of them didn't ever come here planning to stay permanently, 
but they're now afraid to return home because of what's going on in Iraq. I spoke to one man who told me that he gets together every couple of years for a family reunion, but they don't hold it in Iraq. They meet in Lebanon or Jordan or someplace else yeah. with the family and they take a three or four rooms in a hotel and they get together and they party and get to know each other and you know find out what's going on for a week or so and then they come and they go home but they don't go to Iraq. Um, Iraqi Jews, most of them have gone to Israel and they went there after the Second World War for obvious reasons. They were the representative of the enemy in our midst. And some of them, a few, did come to the United States. Um, in Iraq today, Christians are in bad shape. The church, many churches have been burned. Many people and priests have been killed. I remember once um, I was doing interviewing in the community, and um, somebody called up, and they, they had, um, I don't even remember, it must be about, I don't know, eight years ago that they um, blew up a church in uh, Mosul. And there was a, um, a couple who have relatives in the Detroit community who had been in that church um, preparing for their wedding, and they were killed. And it's very difficult to find anybody in this group who, haven't, who can't tell you an experience like that. Um, the Archbishop of Mosul, uh, whose name was Paulus Faraj Rajho, um, was seized, I don't know if you remember, in 2008, and uh, he was kidnapped, and he was found dead about two weeks later. Um, one of the things that happened with the reorganization of the government, before that there had been three provincial seats in the Iraqi government reserved for Christians, and they were removed. So the government today has three parts, Shia, Sunni, and Kurdish, but even the little bit of representation Christians had before are not there. The number of Christians has gone down dramatically in Iraq in the in recent um, years, uh, last four or five years. I just um, there have been some Christian, I'm talking about Christian outside the Middle East. I'm, I'm talking about Christian responses like of the Christian religions. For instance, I mean, this is the, the largest group is Catholic. So you would think the Catholic Church would want to say something about this. Um, and one of the things they did was to name a cardinal, uh, name the, the uh, patriarch of the Chaldean church as a cardinal in 2008, which I guess is a nice symbolic thing to do. I don't know how much I like symbolic things like that, but they did. Uh, the United States State Department in 2000, um, uh, about 2008, called it a country of particular concern, which I guess is kind of an understatement. Um, the uh, United States Committee on International Religious Freedom had proposed that about that time. And this is the group I was talking about earlier. It's called CAMECT, C-A-M-E-C-T, and it stands for Christian and Middle Eastern Churches Together, which met in a, at the Shenandoah Country Club, which is owned by Chaldeans, in February of 2009 to try to pull together these different Christian religious groups to see if they couldn't do something about it. Like I say, uh, yeah, it's kind of symbolic, it's a nice gesture, but I haven't seen much happen to, as a result of it. Um, there, all of these groups have different religious um, experiences prior to coming here. Um, she have always been second-class citizens. Um, they supported the United States in the Gulf War versus Kuwait. Uh, Sunnis have um, been pursued by Shia after Hussein's regime, and um, one of the, I, the probably, I mentioned this example. Um, a mother-infant experience. It was in, in the southern part of, of Iraq, af, after the Kuwait, or during and after the Kuwait War, people were kind of roaming around trying to see if they could 
uh, find relatives. And one man was looking for his um, family, and he found his sister-in-law um, dead in the, on the ground, and her infant baby, her new infant, was still suckling at her breast as she was laying there dead on the ground. And those are the kind of experiences that they talk about. So the, the refugee camps in Syria have had about 800,000. Uh, Jordan about 700,000, Egypt about 80,000. United States, this is our, these are our wars. And we've been criticized internationally for not doing much to help the people that have been affected by them. Um, there are very few Jews left in Baghdad. Um, I'm told that it's less than a million. A million is the number needed to have a Jewish service and we need 10 people and there are probably aren't 10 people left. Um, and most of them left after the foundation of Israel, so they've been gone for quite a while. Um, as a result of this kind of stuff, any refugees who come here are going to be very poor. They, when I say they come with nothing, they really do come with nothing except the clothes on their back. The greatest advantage they have when they get here he has people that they can call upon, relatives, friends, uh, close community, community and communal resources. Some of the resources, the Chaldeans have the Chaldean Ladies of Charity or the Chaldean Federation. The Muslims have access in Dearborn and both have the Arab Chaldean Social Services Council. Uh, the new Karbala Islamic Educational Center and the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. Incidentally, the Chaldean Community Services Groups have gotten a lot of assistance from the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society who've been doing this kind of stuff for a very long time and know how to do it. And so they call them up and they say, what the heck, what do we do now? Um, one of the problems is the way our immigration service works it has this assimilation philosophy that the best way of having a good society here is to get people to assimilate as fast as possible. Forget who you were. Don't bring that with you. Become just like everybody else. And so what they are likely to do is take somebody and say, oh, this is an Iraqi, this is a Chaldean Iraqi. Where should we let them go to when they get here? They would like to go to Detroit. Oh my goodness. Then they'll become part of that great big group. We don't want them to be part of that. We'll send them to Nebraska. Or how about Northern Idaho? And that's a big problem. That, and, and if you talk to people, they think that's a wonderful idea. Good, we want them to spread out so they can't get together. No, you don't want that. You want them to be together so they can help each other, and then they'll all adapt much better, faster. Anyway, that's my, okay, that's a political opinion, no question about it. Um, okay, the Sunni tend to assimilate into the Dearborn Muslim community. Most of them are educated professionals. The Shia tend to move into the um, Dearborn community also because they're Muslim. But most of them join the new Karbala Educational Center. Chaldeans tend to move into North Detroit in one of these eight uh, churches. Or many of them have become assimilated into broader Catholic community. They go to whatever Catholic church happens to be closest to them. Uh, Kurds tend to move in with other Kurds. Um, I told you about Trilock, California. There are some groups around like that, some places like that, where you get people across religious or nationality lines that um, are of similar background. So those are the kinds of things that happen. Probably the worst case scenario is that isolated guy that ends up kind of far away from everything. Anyway, that's about all I have to talk to you about. If people have any questions, I'll be, I don't have a whole lot of time. <laughs> maybe if you, many of you have to leave, maybe if anybody else wants to leave. Talk with them. Talk with you later. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions? Here's one. You mentioned earlier about um, 
on the census survey, yeah. Kelly and Keenan able to check off Aramaic. What are your thoughts about when they apply for schools or for jobs? They're not allowed to mark that they're Arabic or even Iraqi. They're um, grouped in with just white Americans. Actually, uh, they become very imaginative as to what box they check. Um, increasingly, uh, people from Arabic countries are not checking white. I check white because I don't have any other option. I was just curious what you thought. No, about some that. of them don't. Um, they look white to me, but it's an identity factor, not a reality factor. One of the things that we've learned a long time ago about racial identity is it has nothing to do with actual physical differences. It's a social difference. Mm -hmm. And so um, you're right. When it comes to the box, I mean, first of all, no institution will use the Census Bureau boxes. Because if you want to look them up, be prepared to plow through several pages. A little tiny print. And so, no, no school or company is going to give you all those options. Right. I think there are probably today some people, at least in the Detroit area, who are going to write in Arabic or Chaldean because many places will have a, a special box where you can write in. But yeah, Wait, you're right. Doesn't. Those are not options yet. Uh, since uh, when I was teaching in Hamtramck, I noticed there was a lot of uh, people from Yemen, mm -hmm. a lot of Yemeni students, I had a lot of them. And, and I wondered, I did see the Chaldeans, but there were a lot. And I was wondering, you mentioned about assimilating to the broader Muslim and wider communities, but do they sort of like, there isn't the parting off, here's a Yemeni group, and here's a group from Iraq, and here's, they, 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 they mix together? Because I, 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 I saw like, sort of like clumping together when I saw it in the schools. Is that what's happening? In yes, and that takes both sides. Some uh -huh. clump together, uh -huh. and some kind of merge. Uh, I was talking to one of the imams in the Dearborn community a couple of years ago, and he, we got to talking about the Shia Sunni difference. If you wanted to, you could talk about the national differences, because I'm just talking about Iraqis. There are Jordanians, there are Yemeni, there are Saudi Arabia, there are lots of different groups, nationality-wise. And so that's another whole set of, of factors. And um, he was mostly talking about the Muslims in Dearborn. And he said, well, you know what happens. He said, they come thinking, and, and he described it rather well. Their parents come thinking, I am, Shia Iraqi, and somebody else is saying, oh, I am um, Lebanese Sunni. But by the time you get to their kids, the Lebanese, Iraqi, Sunni, Shia is getting less and less important. And they, well, this is Dearborn. Where do they go to school? Well, they go to the high schools. And then they go to Henry Ford Community College or the University of Michigan Dearborn, which is right in the middle. Or maybe they come down here. Some of them do. Some of them are maybe sitting right here. And they meet somebody else who is from across one of those lines. Shia meets Sunni, um, Jordanian meets um, Lebanese or Iraqi, and the differences get less and less important. And that will become true, not just on an interpersonal basis, but organizationally. So, okay, maybe this mosque is more likely to be Iraqis and that one Jordanian, but pretty soon that, that disappears too. So sooner or later, these when they get here, a lot of these things disappear. Because I noticed, I noticed that the kids of like, the, the eager to identify with American culture in the most extreme ways. And it kind of, you know, reminded me. And then, on the other hand, the parents were really traditional, very, very strict, very traditional. But the kids, they just, they were just I, I, doing 
Arabic rap, and I was like, so it got me to thinking that how how we adjust, how people adjust is pull like you're saying, pulling them back and forth. Um, that's assimilation. I mean, that's what the assimilation process is all about. And your description of them pulling them back and forth is part of assimilation. Um, incidentally, the reason I wrote my most recent book, which is about the people who are mixed background, is because I've gotten kind of annoyed with my field. Because, and not just my field, but most fields, psychology, most people who study immigrants have studied those guys who stuck by themselves. And so, and I was guilty. I wanted to know who these people, these Chaldeans were and what were they like. Because they were so unusual and different and fascinating. But really, the interesting bunch are the ones who go across. And so let's talk about those people. Those are the people who are the new guys on the block. They're the ones who are forming a new society. These are the ones that say, who cares what our race was before, our nationality was before, our religion was before. We're becoming Americans. And a lot of the kids, um, some kids are very traditional and do follow their parents. And some kids want to get rid of all that. And an awful lot more are kind of halfway in between. And that's really, if you look back over the past 150 years, that's how we've gotten to be the way we are. And that's a lot of fun to think about, in my view. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Well, letting me talk about my favorite subject. Yeah, <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> I know, I can't help it. <laughs>